Okay, good evening everyone. We're live from uh, the Bank of Ireland's Innovation Lab and this is Digital Irish's presentation of European Tech uh, Night. Um, this, this evening was organized by the uh, Startup Lighthouse and Soft Landing. And it is a departure from a usual Digital Irish event. We're usually extremely Irish focused, Irish companies. And our job for all Ireland companies, technology companies, is to provide a soft landing into this United States market. So we had the opportunity to partner with Startup Lighthouse as well as Soft Landing to, to feature other companies of innovation uh, throughout, uh, throughout Europe. So we're delighted to like spread the footprint a little bit wider and uh, we're gonna learn a lot and, and learn a lot about what's happening in Europe, especially in the um, Internet of Things space, which seems to be the prominent theme of many of the companies that are here tonight. So. Just without much further ado, I'd like to, we have a special um, guest here. We have Ina Friel, who is the Deputy Council General of the Council of Ireland in New York. And she's gonna open up with some opening statements about Ireland and New York. Thanks. Thanks, Marianne. And much like um, Marianne, Digital Irish for the Irish Consulate, it's also unusual to be um, in, a, in a more European focus while we're in the US. So it's absolutely fantastic to be looking at over a whole variety of faces today. I think when we're, we're in, in Europe, we forget how lucky we are with all the diversity. So I'm looking forward to meeting all of you around um, over the course of this evening and hearing all the perspectives. Um, so Marianne just talk, asked me to talk a little bit about Ireland and um, the European Union and, um, and a little reflection on where things are at with regard to Europe in, um, Ireland and the technology space in Europe. So. Um, I guess what first came to, to mind for me, and I'm not a technology person, I'm, I'm an art student, so I you know, didn't really get the whole vibe of things. It's okay, Matt, but I didn't get the whole vibe of things very well. Um, but one of the first things that came to mind for me when I thought about the thing is about the, the possibility and the opportunity that comes with uh, technology as it develops. And, and with that, things that might seem to you like science fiction, last week we had a digital Irish event which was all about artificial intelligence. and. Uh, in some respects, that was bringing to life things that we thought about in the 70s, um, but it also demonstrated the potential and the limitations of everything that goes on in our world today. Um, most recently, in just in September, um, in Dublin, we hosted a, a digital summit on our teacher, our Prime Minister, addressed that summit at the start. And he, he mentioned in his address, he talked about the digital age forcing philosophical and practical questions, um, which I thought was very interesting. He was talking about lives being transformed and there being an onus on all of us to ensure that technology and developments in technology serve people and contribute to our well-being. So that's why I was so intrigued by the theme of this evening's panel around smart cities. And um, that's what it's about, it's about people's lives and making people have um, things happen. So uh, very, I suppose very briefly to, to think about the story of Irish technology. Um, it, if you look at it over time, it, it reads like a story of moving along the value chain. And um, if we go back um, several decades, we talk about Ireland and manufacturing and you know computer chips and things like that that were happening. And then you move along and you see um, a lot of activity in sales and marketing, and then at the moment some very key niche operations around risk and data, for example. Um, and now we're looking a lot to the future to research engineering. Um, and Ireland is looking to situate itself as a place for fostering debate around that. Um, we've had a lot of policy continuity through our governments, um, high quality education, tax rates, English speaking, various things like that. But we've also recognised that you need to invest in your people. And that comes to a few different uh, points that I just wanted to make around the work of what our agencies do. So the, um, the IDA, for example, um, which is a, um, our direct investment agency for Ireland, and um, they put a lot of work into supporting um, part on a partnership basis different centres that work to um, bring together research and industry. And there's a number of leading light ag agencies that are um, active in Ireland, um, Tyndall, um, Cron, Lero, Insight, for example, all of them working in pretty in, 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 for groundbreaking and transformative work as research centres. Um, but also then we've got some innovative things that are Enterprise Ireland, for example, we're doing, I know Enterprise Ireland works a lot with them. Um, with uh, in supporting the startups, that they have a venture capital arm, for example, which has invested about two billion dollars uh, in the Irish companies, which gives us unusual. It gives us an ability to um, invest directly into companies rather than going through uh, private investors, and allows us to support um, 
innovation and, and creativity. One of my favorite statistics out of the Enterprise Ireland um, uh, uh, Fund is that um, oh, just over a third of those are, are, led by, um, are led by women, which is actually way above average. Um, so it's possible because we have our own seed fund. And I know one of the Irish companies here today is founded by a woman um, and is also Enterprise Ireland supported. So I think that's I don't think that's an example that we can be proud of. Um, the other thing, um, maybe just to very quickly mention, is that we're, we are looking to the future a lot. We're looking to investing, investing in skills and education. There's about 2.2 billion euro going into um, education and infrastructure over the next 10 years. But that's being set up, um, being, being supported by a strategy around future jobs and future jobs Ireland, and looking to, to what those jobs will look like. Um, there's um, a lot of debate, just to bring it into the European context, there's a lot of debate that goes on around the demand for regulation on one, on one end and then the not desire not to stifle um, innovation on the other. And that's something that in Ireland and the Irish government is quite conscious about trying to get that balance right. Um, the project here this evening is supported by Horizon 2020, which is the European Union um, fund. And its um, successor program, known as Horizon Europe, is actually um, going to be uh, the, the Director General of um, Science Foundation Ireland, Mark Ferguson, is, is leading on that. And that's the, the bringing of research and collaboration. And interestingly, Science Foundation Ireland has just opened um, an office in Silicon Valley. So all these links between Europe, Ireland and the US are all starting to come together. And we're hoping that as, as new initiatives come to the fore, we're seeing e-privacy, copyright, all these areas coming onto the agenda, um, that Ireland will be out there speaking for a pro-innovative, um, pro-innovation environment. Um, and also, I think, interesting of note for, for the European Union is that it has just, um, in the new in incoming commission, um, given a, an ambition to be, bring Ireland, or bring Europe fit for the digital age. So we put down to all sorts of questions around, you know, that we've been dealing with data protection, industry standards, etc. How do we make all of that fit for the digital age? So, very, very quick overview. Um, I just want to give one thought, perhaps, for the smart cities conversation later, and it's something that um, struck me when I was thinking about um, the reflecting on the, the seminar last week, which we had around uh, um, artificial intelligence and all the data that you put into something and what that turns, turns out and, and what you get at the end of it. Um, and it brought to mind similarly something that I've been reading recently about when we're designing um, cities or when cities have been developing or when um, medical um, innovations have been developing and the, the data gap that comes from that. So whether the data is sufficiently aggregated for gender, and di for diversity, for all those questions. And that's I think something of a challenge for us as we look at technology in smart cities. How do we know that what we're putting into it is equally adequate for what we want to get out of it? So that's my thought for the evening. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you very much. Great. We're going to do a little uh, digital Irish housekeeping, and then we're going to go right into um, startup lighthouse and um, and soft landing. So, what do we do? Well, with the digital Irish community, we we grow the global innovation Irish innovation uh, network. Um, we're looking for companies that we can feature in our pitch nights. So, if you have uh, if you are an Irish company or you want to make a soft landing here in the United States. Um, go see Gavin, because he's the person who will probably find the right product there for you to be on. Um, and we're also helping people pitch for investment, so we also have an angel, uh, Digital Irish Angels, that has private investing. There's Digital Irish, that's a not-for-profit, which is the event that you're attending here tonight, and there's a Digital Irish Angel, that also I'll give you a little more detail on that in the next slide. Um, and we're also uh, trying very hard for any J1 uh, people that are over here. We'd like to help them find a job. So if you have a job and if you have uh, a need for an up and coming and, and, and someone in an entry level position, um, marketing, digital, all different types, financial services especially, also get in seat to Gavin because he runs the program. Uh, who are we? Well, Digital Irish is 3,000 members strong. Um, we've made, uh, the Digital Irish has made seven investments and have um, featured over 150 startups, and with thousands and thousands and infinity of, of, of connections. One thing that we always do with Digital Irish events is any company that's up here that's pitching, or uh, we really, really want to know what is your ask. You have an audience here, you have an audience online that's watching live, that will watch also on demand. What are you looking for? Do not be afraid, you're in New York, ask for it. 
Okay, this is the board of Digital Irish. If you're on the board, you please raise your hand. Uh, myself, Gavin, there's Refni. Um, we also have Ashling Coffey, who is doing our, our project management on this. We have Gene Unit on social media. I think I saw Patrick McAndrews around here. So anyway, we're a board. Um, um, I think we're pretty diverse. I mean, with the age, and there's, I think there's two Americans on it, so I guess that's a good quota. <laughs> Whatever, they tolerate me, let me tell you, okay? <laughs> and our sponsors, and I just see Nicole Williams in the back from White and Williams. Um, is a corporate law firm specializing in international law, uh, who's been a longtime supporter of us. And also we have uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs, which is Emer, who just came up. We really appreciate the funding of the Irish government. And then McEntee Law, which is uh, based out of Chicago, Fiona McEntee. You probably follow her on Twitter. She's incredible. And uh, is doing some really great things in immigration law. And you're wondering why we're charging you $10 to get in. Well, we do that so you show up, okay? Uh, we're funded. So what we do with that $10 is that we give it to a charity. Last year, it was Coder Dojo and we gave them a couple thousand dollars. This year, it's the um, Irish American Partnership based out of Boston, and what they do is provide educational programs for primary schools in STEM in Ireland, all Ireland, North and, and the Republic. So we figured it would be really great for, you know, your, your $10 to go to helping kids getting some good STEM education. What's up? We're actually introducing a podcast series with Patrick McAndrews is here. We've already started uh, recording innovation leaders. Uh, if there's some people that you think you would like to be featured or you would like to be on a podcast, and this would be going globally on the, under the Digital Irish Aegis, uh, please go and see Gavin, myself, Patrick, Ashling, even Jean, who are all part of this, uh, this marketing effort. Jobs, Career One, J1, there's some things in the work for, for deepening our, our, our ability to help the J1s, people as they go over, even before they come over, if that can happen. And also, we're very pleased that we are starting to program a series of London events and Chicago <coughs> events. Um, one of our board members, Jack Stenson, was just moved to London, so he's really carrying the digital Irish flag there. And in fact, that's Jack right there from a live webcast uh, this early this month. We webcast all of our programs, we capture all of our content, and we have it on demand on our Facebook and on our, our YouTube page. Um, so please go there. Um, any, 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 there's a film that's being made that was under the aegis of Startup Lighthouse. We'll also feature that. We think content's a terrible thing to waste. And I skipped it. So now I'd like to introduce Kate Hogan and Yurga. Mentioned Skinner. <laughs> who are going to tell us all about Startup Lighthouse and, um, and Soft Landing. So just uh, to introduce myself, my name is Kate Hogan, and I am obviously Irish from my accent, but I, I work for the DC Ryan Academy in Dublin, and uh, one of our um, projects uh, for the last two years has been Startup Lighthouse, uh, and uh, the DC Ryan Academy, just to go back to it a little bit, is um, mainly a travel uh, accelerator, but we also help entrepreneurs to sort of grow their business. We specialize with really, um, uh, female founders is a, is a really uh, big one for us. Um, student, student entrepreneurship, um, getting researchers to commercialize their business, which is tricky sometimes, um, and uh, then migrant workers as well. So we have quite a social side as well as being um, uh, involved in travel tech. Um, and you're just going to tell you a bit more about the community today as well. Uh, hi, so thanks uh, for having us here today. Uh, my name is Yurga, uh, as you've uh, already learned, uh, with a very difficult to pronounce uh, last name. So I represent Startup Division, and we are based in Lithuania. We are a startup support organization, and we do different initiatives both in Lithuania, but also at an pan European level. So our focus is to help uh, both aspiring entrepreneurs, as well as uh, founders and startups to get traction in the home markets, to find the product market fit, and also to go global to other markets. So we do that through different projects and initiatives, and uh, one of those is soft landing. Okay, and, and as I said, my name is Startup Lighthouse. Uh, we find for this sort of to make our book go further and sort of well reviewed. But the whole idea of this is, um, as Ema was saying, um, Europe is looking to have uh, one uh, digital economy, and they're looking at different ways of doing it. And one of the ways that uh, they've um, selected is to sort of go on these um, 
solutions, especially to other other uh, ecosystems. Ourselves, we're involved with uh, Dublin, Brisbane, uh, Berlin, and um, that too, the uh, the the sort of where we met, um, and sort of in two deep intensive weeks, um, in each of those cities, specialising in the city's particular version of whatever their interests are in Dublin, be it travel tech and tech. one week programs and our objective is really to give startup founders a very immersive experience in a foreign market. Um, so we kind of uh, try to help them make the decision whether that's the right market for them and if it is what they need to know to scale to that particular destination. So most of our uh, programs run in Europe but we also do a couple to the United States and the format of the program really is um, allows uh, those startups to make those very valuable connections in those markets that would be very difficult to obtain if they just went there on their own. Um, and usually we start by meeting with uh, local founders. We give an overview of the market, how it's structured, what's the funding level like, what are the other verticals that are really popular. Um, we uh, also meet with the lawyers and we also met with White and Williams uh, during this week in New York, uh, which was super insightful. So we. Uh, help to answer the questions about you know how to set up uh, a legal entity, what type of legal entity this should be. Uh, we also meet with other uh, organizations that help answer questions: how to do sales in the U.S., how it should be different from uh, you know how your positioning should be different from Europe. Um, what are the key kind of uh, how to approach investors and what what is accepted in this culture? And also we talk a lot with founders and especially founders who come from Europe to give a perspective on the US market and share their uh, experiences. So we hope that throughout the week, uh, startup founders kind of get a very good idea of how to do business in a particular country and also are equipped with the knowledge and the initial contacts that they can later utilize uh, to scale to that market. Yeah, just, just one last, so overall it's about creating connections and I think that's, that's exactly what we've been doing here and throughout your cities and, and the future and data and integration we're going to have each company will give a three minute pitch um, and uh, about who they are and what they're asking for here in the states so I, I'm juggling microphones here but let me just uh, maybe choose an assistant development hardware, software, and connectivity, an all-in-one telematics solution that saves maintenance and operations costs while providing extra services to third parties. Next person is Aisha Bagari, sorry, from Revolt, and the E is silent, <laughs> and Revolt builds mobile applications which, which engages energy users, gamifies energy demand and provides added value on smart meter data. The mobile application provides transparency on energy consumption and carbon footprint. It incentivizes users to increase their efficiency and provide added value, added values based on their consumption patterns. Okay, for the, uh, Neilan from StoryTracks from Ireland. StoryTracks is a global storytelling as a service platform. It creates an immersive, highly engaging mobile application which allows travel clients to distribute content to multiple channels as well as create their own bespoke audio guides. And next to the stage, please, will uh, Christian Keim from Nevis Q come? From Germany. 
okay? Um, Nevis Q brings IoT and data analytics to nursing homes. Their smart baseboards enables, uh, enable staff uh, to work more efficiently by automatically notifying them about critical situations like falling, getting up from bed, or leaving the room. Their unique sensor band is placed on top of baseboards to analyze activities in the room while always respecting the patient's privacy. The next person I'd like to call up is Lucinda Kelly from Ireland in Poverty. Poverty is a retail analytics company in location intelligence for marketers and retailers seeking retail spaces. They connect location, excuse me, they connect location intelligence for targeting audiences and campaign measurements, sharing insights such as footfall, dwell times, and audience profile campaigns in one self-service platform. platform. Finally, I'd like to have called to the stage is Simon. Simon, I didn't get to your last name. Nitzeno? Nitzeno. Oh, skipped a syllable, sorry. From Estonia. And this is Precision Navigation Systems. Their product, Hive, is a cloud based solution for super accurate global navigation satellite systems. Positioning and navigating. Positioning and navigating. Hive, Hive helps drones, robots, and other GNSS equipped. Um, autonomous systems to be positioned, navigated, and tracked within one inch precision in real time. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our panel. To the so we had a little time to chat uh, in our green room, which was a conference room here at the Bank of Ireland's innovation um, uh, space. I would just like one, just for the New York audience, uh, what's your biggest takeaway about coming to New York and meeting other companies and, and, and people like our, our, our sponsors, White and Williams? What's the biggest takeaway you got from coming to New York and how to do business? Well, yeah, I've, I've been a big man of New York all my life, from Coogies and the music and the looks and that. Um, what, what I love and what I notice about the characters in the streets in New York is everyone knows where the best slice of pizza is and I want to tell you. <laughs> this is the best bar, this is the best bar. Here's the speakeasy, that's great. And I noticed it's the exact same in the business. So people want to, it's like, want to be the one that's connecting you to other people. And I seem to be amazingly open about that. And that's really, really refreshing. So it's, it, it's been, that, that's what really empowers the business experience. We like to share what we know. Yeah. Okay, great. Right. Right. Any other questions about New York City, coming to New York and learning to, to, to start pl planning out your, uh, your strategy to do business here? Yeah, so basically, I, I'm coming from the Netherlands. Uh, well, actually, I live there, I'm coming from the Russian. And they say that Dutch people are the most direct people, but actually, in New York, it's even more direct. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's actually really great for business. Terrific. Uh, I learned that this is not even the only thing. <laughs> 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 yeah, all the room has been dead. <laughs> Speaking loudly here as well. So. <laughs> I would agree on that. So, actually, what we can learn, I think, is that we can be much more self confident, uh, self -confident about our ideas. We can be much more louder. And, uh, yeah, sometimes I think we are too, too uh, holding us too, too, too much down. A little too much. I agree as well. I think it, the difference I see from Ireland and the States is they ask for so much more money and there's so much more money in this ecosystem. So we might in Ireland do a seed round. We did one, say, of half a million, but the seed here might be five million. So it, it's just bigger and it is down to confidence. And if you have to go out there, there's so much more money and it's like it's just a different ballgame to Ireland completely. I will stand on like a secret to share. <laughs> a secret? We love secrets. Yes, this year. Originally, I'm from Siberia. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, like, I spent most of my uh, most of my life over there. So when I come to the U.S., uh, I also spend a lot of time in, in Europe, of course. But what I see is that the this aggress aggressiveness of the surroundings, of the of everything that surrounds you, right? The, the time pressure. Uh, Fast movement, I don't know, when people are direct with you, it reminds me home, you know? So, <laughs> so it's like tough guys living here, and New York, of course, is uh, blowing away like this whole Siberian guy. 
Great, well you can tell us about your winners so we can get a little bit better. I'd like to ask all of you just to get started, you know, anyone that goes on this road of entrepreneurship, I mean, there has to be a, a problem to be solved. So what is the problem that compelled you to spend all your free time and more than that and ask friends and family for money? What was the problem that, that compelled you to start your company, problem to be solved? But I, you know, I'm just thinking my problem was myself <laughs> because <laughs> I wasn't happy. I, I was in the corporate world, so the problem was I wanted to get out. So that's the pretty problem. Um, and then going into, we did an accelerator where we were pretty much a basic marketplace, which was Airbnb for pop-ups. And we thought that was the problem, but that problem wasn't big enough. So, so for us, just broadly, the problem is um, enabling brands and marketers to have data insights for the bricks and mortar world equivalent to what they would have in, in the online world. And that problem is big, which is good for us. I'm a mathematician, so I like to solve problems. <laughs> and um, yeah, actually, that's um, the main reason why I started the startup. Because when there is a problem, I'm somebody who says, OK, let's, let's change that. And yeah, in my case, it was that we had a lecture at the university, and I met some of the co-founders. And yeah, we did some, let's say, business plan brainstorming session, um, how to improve the LF care. And yeah, that's how NavisQ developed. So now we are like maybe four years old. And um, yeah, we all have some background in the nursing care sector. So um, yeah, we, we had some knowledge about that. And it is really yeah, interesting for us to, to bring that um, sector into the future. Well, when I started out on this journey with story tracks, um, it, it certainly wasn't a ready thing. I, I didn't know business. Problem I came across was um, my father, some, some of the elderly Irish in the audience will remember Ted Needham. He was a, a broadcaster back in RTE, and, um, and he went on to become a politician himself. He was actually a corporate minister back in Gary Fitzgerald's government. Um, he passed away five years ago, and this amazing career was a fantastic story. Best story that he was. And, um, and when he passed, somebody, somebody stood. And that's happened every single day, uh, not just in Ireland, but in every city in the world, in every town in the world. So that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah, for me, it was uh, living in Germany. I heard stories about the Indian transition. But then, as a consumer, I, I looked around and I had no options actually to do anything to make a difference in any capacity. And that's how uh, I started to think into what we can do to empower the consumer. And Data scientist of my, uh, so my other half, looking at my data science background, I saw so much opportunity in the data that's being generated in the smart home and smart energy sector. And so it somehow came together that I started uh, revolt in actually using the data in smart energy and actually helping consumers in their homes to actually make a difference and do the energy transition. Uh, so on my side, I was working in startups pretty much the, my whole life. And at some point, startups turned into big corporates, which really upset me in terms of working conditions and, and stuff like that. Um, and the, the company I was working for was Tom in, in Amsterdam. Um, and actually, all these kind of companies, they try to digitize uh, traditional businesses like transportation, mining, construction, but they don't do it the right way. So that's why we started. This is the most difficult question for me for all the time. Why did you start doing that? So I don't really know what to do with my life. But uh, at the moment when we, all, when we started working in that company, so I was just a fresh dropped out of the university. Before that, I took an academic career, uh, and then uh, left to India where I worked for half a year. Then I came back, what would I do? After finishing studies in Siberia, maybe just uh, run away. Uh, back to India, I grew up for forever. And then I met my co-founder and the co-founding team that they were, so this type of projects, they just come pop out of ideas. So their, their workshop, ground workshop was done before. And they were working on the technology for precise positioning, navigation, and it was five years back. So we worked our way uh, in Russia, except there is a ceiling that you cannot cross because of the problems in economy, politics, investment climate. And uh, we came, we came 
came out to Europe uh, with the help of an accelerator, set of wise guys, and we saw that uh, really the technology that we were building is going to be used by drones, robots, autonomous cars. Everything is just emerging. So let's let's use our competences here. So that, that's that's the show. Wonderful to, to talk about the journey of what propels an entrepreneur, a creator, to, to go on the problem you're solving. And now that you're on this journey, I'm sure that you've been some, uh, some interesting discoveries along the way, um, some bumps in the road, as you always say, but also some aha moments. And I just thought a quick a few of, um, of your companies is really too consumer focused. I think Revolt and Story um, is, is really a real more consumer focused, and the rest are more institutional focused with fleets, healthcare, and then also really precision navigation for drones, and then also in the retail market, which is consumer focused in a way, but you're also working with the brands and the agencies in which to, to, to develop, uh, to really to foster uh, more traffic campaigns and more uh, penetration of the market. So with all of that, I mean, you have all these wonderful things you're doing, but I think the one thing you have <coughs> all together is vast amounts of data. Vast amounts of data, and I'd love to hear stories of where the data took you, where it surprised you, where it might even take you into another vertical. I'm really trying to get at, you're in one sector right now. How can you contribute what you know to building, as Ina was saying, the, 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 the smart cities or the deepening of the, of the investigation of AI, machine learning, and also how we, how we construct the world? It's a very large ask, but I want to know, along the way, you're collecting data. What was the discoveries, and where do you think you can, there's a, maybe even a higher purpose in your own company in which to, uh, to do it? Do you want to start on the second one? Sure. Um, so actually, the whole purpose of our company is collecting the data. And we've been around the world for two years now. Um, and the next step is actually processing the data to make it sense of. And that's what we are trying to, to start doing at the moment. Starting with the transportation. Uh, in Europe, there is a trend moving towards greener transportation, so powered by electricity, um, using elect electric buses instead of diesel. But it's a humongous problem if you if you don't have the data from your vehicles, you have no idea how you can plan it, um, plan the simple charging action. So with a diesel bus, you just refuel it, go again. Char electric charging, you have to have your power grid working, you need to know how much time the, the bus is going to be charged, um, how many stations you actually have available. So getting all this data is amazing, but it will be a humongous uh, work actually to, um, to use it. Well, wouldn't that then also inform an urban planner about how to build roads and how to build certain transportation of the efficiency of it. Do you see any any um, any consumer changing behavior? Have you seen any of those little like they bypass this or will they adapt to that or they just don't want to deal with it? Well, at the moment, the problem is that uh, it's a new industry, so nobody knows how it works. So there is a, a time element pretty much. Um, and indeed, there is regulators involved that, that push on operators and consumers have all of these regulations that were built to block on the knowledge, not just because they decided to. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, your data, if it got into a large consortium, could really affect urban planning, but could also affect just smart city decisions. Absolutely. And urban planning, uh, infrastructure planning, <coughs> uh, power grid, as I mentioned, and communication resources. Terrific. I hope you get that seat at the table soon.
planning of uh, how the grid should look like in the future, but also how the city is growing and how the city is expanding. So this has a lot of value of the smart meter data, and but it's a very it's a hard data to actually track. Uh, this is uh, the meters have a different frequency of data and a lot of technical things behind it. And what we are doing is we are taking this data to actually first understand the user within their homes, but also uh, in the future to use this data for grid operators to actually understand the grid better for power companies to understand how to supply power better. So in, in many ways, it's like the old Nielsen, like the, your gamification of, of smart energy use for the consumer in their home, and that data is then going to be hopefully translated into in, into powering better communities. Yeah, because it could tell you which are the hot spots uh, uh, within the city. It could tell the grid operators or uh, planners how to actually plan the infrastructure in the city. So this is a lot of value. And what we do is we actually make it easy for consumers to uh, give us this data. And then we can use this to actually make the city better as well. It's, that's it's really sure, right. It's like even the free TV guide that you watch every watch TV watching habit. So that's the old days of doing it. Yeah. So that's great. So it's good that you're getting actual like boots on the ground. I would say with the consumer is voting with the gamification. So how about with with, with story with story tracks? I mean, I think ha, have you seen anything that has changed with the location that may might have a lot of people maybe writing about like the wild planet way? Is there any Sort of the cluster effect has happened. I'm just I'm grabbing here. I think that yes, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, just to give give the audience a bit of context, we just launched the application, the mobile application for the first time in hotel, which is the Dublin Liberties. So you'll see here we paint these stories with these lovely vivid colored icons, and they're all to do with categories: folklores, history, there's food and drink. Now, as the visitor lands a destination, they download the app. This gives them a truly immersive guide, but it's the local people, it's the local man who used to make the, the beer batters and Guinnesses, and it's, it's the old flower seller telling the stories. So what we can do, my dad ran down the corner of Jerry Lock, and he's a fantastic wizard there with, with data, and we put advanced Google Analytics onto every single point of engagement on this application. So we can tell you what the stories they're listening to, how long they listen to the stories, if they share these stories, and see which categories they're interested in. And in particular, outside of the city, as you mentioned, the Wild Atlantic Way, we can capture the locations that visitors are, 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 are traveling to, which is, we know the cities, we know we're spending an overnight accommodation, but we don't know what, which high roads and by roads around, around Kerry are going. So well, we should let now, given some uh, tourism Ireland know about this, I mean, he'd be very interested, he'd be great for his traction, but no, it's just true. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> you can know right now. I know. <laughs> oh, my friends at the homecoming. So, how about with, with, with your health services? I mean, I do have plans for expansion beyond nursing homes, correct? Uh, yeah, definitely. Actually, for us, it's sometimes not easy to, to remain the focus because we have a sensor solution for rooms. And I mean, think about rooms. There are rooms everywhere. Yesterday, I was talking to somebody about containers. I mean, that's also a room. And we could also use the sensors in containers. Um, so there are two reasons why we focused on nursing homes. First of all, we had the best fit there, because in other application fields, we might have a benefit, a little benefit, but we saw that really in the nursing care, we can have a great benefit. And uh, the second, uh, second reason is that actually, we, we like to work in the nursing care mode. So we were not so, so, so uh, curious about other fields and uh, I mean what we have learned is um, first of all it's very important to think about the user because we have nurses and at least in Germany what we noticed is um, they, they have kind of a black and white picture either something is bad or either something is great and uh, so we have to be really focused how we design the product how we communicate the product because when we come with uh, to them with our product Sometimes we hear like, ah, oh, we will be, um, we will leave, uh, we will lose our jobs because of the technology and so on. And then we show them what the system does, and all of a sudden it changes totally. Uh, I have a question: Do those nurses then tell you what they really want? Yes, they are very direct, uh, but you have to. Uh, and maybe they are. We get beyond male pay on stay out, right? Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, but you have to give them. Um, how do you say? Uh, you have to let them. 
to tell you. I mean, we know that other companies, they don't listen to the users. They don't listen to customers. They build a product, they bring it to market, and then uh, they are looking how it is going. But what we hear from customers is that we are very customer-centric, and they really like that. I mean, they, they really like to talk what are their problems, how, how should it be designed, and so on and so forth. And, um, the second thing is like uh, communication, uh, also about data. Um, I mean, Germany is considered as a, is well known uh, for data privacy and so on and so forth. So we are very careful there. Um, but when you when you show them how you are um, using the data, that there is everything anonymous, and that is that it, that it has, actually has a, a benefit, a real benefit, then it's much easier to, to convince people uh, about the system. Um, I think it's not a good idea to maybe to hide things, like not telling how it is uh, going, like I don't know, maybe Facebook is doing. I think the collaboration is very interesting. I mean, if you have multiple, multiple stakeholders at the table, um, you get a richer product. So I'd love to hear, Lucinda, like you have a, a vast product, actually, and a, and, and a mandate foot traffic and, and dealing with the actual brands and the manufacturers and all of that. So just vision of the data that you are collecting, you're obviously helping people who are being paid to market, but where do you think in a smart, like, you know, inner city, or how could you impact a smart city a conversation? Yeah, we do get it. So just for context, we Telefonica is an investor of ours, and we use data in the UK from 27 million handsets, people movements. And one challenge most of us will have is GDPR, and actually an anonymization and aggregation of data. So we get asked that a lot by investors. We combine that data with SDK data, which is basically the apps you have on your phone, like weather, news, dating. They are commercializing your data feeding it into an API which we consume. It's an organized and aggregated to fully compliant, but, but what we do is we're giving data points um, at a 50 meter radius to every retail space in the UK, and our customer is typically a digital marketer or has access to programmatic media where they have amazing analytics for targeting, measuring campaigns, and we're tr trying to bring that to the, the offline world. And, and to answer your question, the future of retail for us is, oh, I'm, I'm, I talk with my co-founder about this a lot, is retail as media. So what we have is retail is changing. You know, there's a lot of um, shops dying off, particularly in the UK, the States, you've got other kind of happening. And for us, the future of media is not about transactional retail in a shop. It's about experiential retail. So the, the online channel is going to be an e-commerce channel where you actually transact. But in order to retain customers and build loyalty, the offline channel is the experience. And we've got brilliant brands coming up doing this. You know, the leaders are the likes of the Apples or, you know, Nike are really good at experiences and, and, and they're the ones that are converging online and offline. But to enable this retail as media, you need to create data. So the punt that we're taking in property is actually opening up data at a price point that works for brands and marketers and enabling them to do pop-ups or to create concept stores, but really have a data-driven approach to why they're selecting a location. And what's happened, and to your original question, is we started with short-term retail, but we were asked, they, because our data is very powerful, particularly with having Telefonic as the backbone of the data, um, because there's a lot of data out there, but there's a lot of bad data, so it's important if, if it's accurate, but actually, with store closures and the change in retail, it's actually giving these uh, retailers insights to make better decisions. So no longer is it just because at that till that didn't make as much money, we closed this down. There might be other reasons why they should keep that one and actually choose another. So the future of those cities for retail is having accessible data to make these decisions. And on my side, you know, with uh, all these autonomous machines uh, that are produced or that are going to be produced, people kind of want to know where these machines are, where they're going, or where, they're, where they're, you know, where, what they've done. So that's why tracking and positioning, especially precise positioning, is uh, coming to its height, we believe. But why, uh, why is that, actually? The technologies, we see that there's a shift in technologies, uh, because uh, if you guys came here with, the, with an Uber or with Lyft, uh, you might have experienced that the that you probably cannot find the car uh, even on the map on your smartphone or 
that your driver cannot find you besides uh, what he actually sees where you are. The problem is that the GPS chip inside our phone is too weak. In the last years, new chips are coming, they are still on our phones, unfortunately, but they're getting cheaper, they're getting smaller, they're getting more affordable, and uh, they're going to be used by all this new different types of technologies. And uh, the thing is that you should position autonomous car with a lane accuracy for security reasons, put in an HD map, so put in a uh, computer generated portal, right? So, but coming closer to consumer market, it's not the market so far because of the price, but even uh, you probably uh, heard how dangerous e-scooters could be because people use them on pedestrian roads, people use them uh, on motorways, what I mean is basically outside bicycle roads, so roads where they should be. But if you know where the scooter is, you can just decrease the speed or stop it. So until someone will come back to the uh, bicycle road and continue with the uh, use of their feet. So yeah, it's it's still not there at many points, but it's going to be there. Let me go here now. Yeah, well, I would like to conclude the panel here. We're going to have questions afterwards, um, and, and we would love, though, for each of the companies to come up and just give us a three-minute pitch on who they are, what, what their product is, and what they're asking for. Um, and then definitely we'll have Q&A here, and then this food and drink, as you know, plenty back there. So let's see who is first up. Hey, Sergey, it's you. So I'll have everyone else sit here. Oh, give me a And if I give you the phone, then I'll give you the phone. Hi, everyone. My name is Sergey, and I'm a co founder of CAP. Uh, CAP is an IT platform with house developed hardware software utility. So probably all of you who got a car got stuck with a red light on your dashboard once upon a time, preventing you from driving your vehicle. Annoying, right? <laughs> but <laughs> on, this, on a small park of 500 vehicles, 1% of downtime could cost you easily half a million euros. And that's where we come into play. So we install our devices in all kinds of vehicles assets, buses, trucks, excavators, cranes, forklifts, you name it. Uh, we get the data from the onboard computers and all the sensors surrounding them, uh, get it into the cloud platform, and help uh, owners to cut down the cost of maintenance and operation. Uh, so let me let me show it on the example of um, bus transportation. That's our most strongest use case with uh, over uh, 1,500 buses all over the world. They become smarter and smarter with different sensors tracking the vehicle itself, but also passengers and drivers. And what we do, um, we basically connect all the sensors and information systems, uh, like for example, external displays, uh, sensors checking on the oil, uh, breathalyzers, which is especially important in France where they drink wine during the lunch time. Uh, so we, we try to, to get all this data into our platform to keep the vehicles moving, to keep people safe. And uh, our partners get this data from the APIs or end customers get it from the web platform. So this is how it looks. Uh, here you can see in real time uh, exactly all the problems with the vehicle that you have. Uh, we provide, of course, all kinds of reports. Also, we are brand independent, so the next purchase uh, that you do for, for, for your for your fee, uh, you basically can uh, get a better deal by saying, okay, what my first is not really performing very well. Uh, and what happens is um, we are not a standard cinematics uh, company, so we take it by the hand and we really implement the audio space from start to the end. Uh, management team both uh, coming from the technical background. My co-founder Paul is um, responsible for sales. Myself, um, I'm responsible for R&D. 
So we've been around for two years. Uh, last year we made over half a million euros with, uh, with a team of three. This year we're already five people and targeting one million euros by the end of this year. Um, we are based in Amsterdam, but we have a sales office in Paris as well. Uh, our clients are big transportation companies, construction companies, local governments, and uh, OEMs. And we are here in New York to find some new partners and customers. So hopefully we will get some connections. Thank you. Saturday night when myself and my co-founder in the back chair landed in New York City. We were tired after a long flight, but really looking forward to getting settled into our salubrious Lower East Side accommodation. <laughs> 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 I just said from a horror movie, right? 
We're starting to take right. God, let's just cancel the bucket and move somewhere else tomorrow. But what if at that very moment, what popped the story on the story tracks out about Kevin Mulcahy, this man in the top right hand corner? He left Ireland in the 1950s, emigrated. All he has is his little, no contacts, no friends, no job set up. And he stayed right down here in the back cubicle, thinking at home, lonely, took out his fiddle and played. And he quit. All of a sudden, the door started opening, and the feet started walking out to the room. A knock on the door, a German man comes in. A knock on the door, a Jewish man comes in. A knock on the door, an Italian. welcome and embrace him and get him jobs and make him friends. So we decide, you know, let's stay here the rest of the week. There's more to this place. It's got rich history. This is what we do. Story track scratches beneath the surface of the obvious and brings local stories to life. Engaging, immersive, authentic, real stories by local people in destination. And this is a massive, massive problem in the travel industry at the moment. There's a significant lack of in-destination touch points back to the major brands. So we all come here with the airlines, with the hotels. It's a captive audience. Yet we only touch base when there's a problem. Luggage is lost, or when you want to move hotels. But what if we enhance the customer experience and also have a way with these digital touch points to drive ancillary revenues back to travel brands. And this isn't just the research that shows it's a top trend in need. We've engaged with the major sea level executives, the Travel Board, Lonely Planet, and um, as, as, as well as major um, online travel agencies. So you see here as well, our platform ties in with the number one priority of millennials today, which is experiential. They're no longer, look at the buses that are going around New York, they're no longer fun anymore. The millennials want to travel, they don't want to go on a guided bus tour. They want to do their own thing, they want to self-discover, and our platform allows for this as well. So you'll see what the Vice President of Lonely Planet thinks of our platform, and the real need, and it's a real urgent need in this industry at the moment, to capture this audience. So we do this by real life stories pinned to location, sourced, crowdsourced content to create a unique two-way conversation with visitors back to the brand. I'm delighted to announce we've just launched a mobile application for the Hyatt Hotel in Dublin. Very interested, and a major Hyatt chain is very interested in this pilot and how we can push it out right to 837 hotels worldwide. Team Gerald Lachlan is our, our data man, our spreadsheet man. He's 14 years experience in the travel industry, ex hostel world. He's a wizard with spreadsheets and data, all the stuff that I hate. So <laughs> I have a background in visual storytelling, film, and television. And as I explained earlier, this is, this is a real passion for me, so we're making this work. That's it. Um, so, our revenue streams we have the B2B licensing platform, such as the Hyatt, and we're also looking at the tourism activity sector, which is 180 billion, growing 10% annually. And we're looking at licensing and affiliation through that. Also, a major play for us is building up our content creators. That's one of the reasons we came to New York with some fantastic meetings with major media publishing houses and how to create this content worldwide. So for us, authenticity and local, it's a buzzword in the market at the moment. For us, authenticity is in our veins. It's the real deal. And back home in Ireland, we work with students, 16-year-old transitioning students, that we've sent out to capture stories of the grandparents and pin them to locations. And we also send it to nursing homes as well. It's, it's, it's a beautiful project. Um, we work on this one here, is with Core Voices. So we partnered with a corporate stakeholder engagement platform and we captured stories of marginalized community groups and given and empowered them with their voice. So it's, it's, it's the real deal for us. Future plans to become the largest global storytelling platform in the world. We're also very interested in integrating AR solutions, which could work really well with new Google Maps. So my ask, firstly, and now for the Irish government, They've been great. Local Enterprise Office, Enterprise Ireland have been fantastic. Startup Lighthouse guys, soft landed, amazing. What a week, brilliant. And um, my ask, I suppose, to the digital Irish in the New York community is um, if, if there is some wealthy angel investors in the Irish American community, 
then he would like to assist us in this project of, of capturing the folklore and heritage of our country and preserving it. Not only that, but you'll also have a piece of the largest colonial storytelling platform in the world that could move not just travel right across but multiple verticals. So please join us and become part of our story. Kelly, the CEO and co-founder of Poverty, 
Um, we were founded in Dublin in 2016 and are based in Dublin, London and are building out a, a development team out of Bulgaria. So our vision is a big one and it is to be the leader in audience insights connected to retail or physical spaces for marketers, retailers and landlords. And what we're building is a system or an ecosystem of online metrics for the offline world. So what's the problem? Um, retail, some say it's dead, but it's definitely changing. Um, I spoke about it on the panel. Retail is about experiential, uh, but the metrics for measuring experiential aren't widely available to say this works or this doesn't work. Um, retail is about customer loyalty and building these experiences, but again, how can you measure if these experiences work? Um, there's a huge shift in convergence with online and offline, and again, we have these amazing analytics in the online world and you come into the offline or the bricks and mortar and they're not widely available. So data sets traditionally are historic data like CACI or Axiom or their enterprise level costs so aren't affordable for a lot of businesses. Um, and lastly, we've got a big shift in leases in retail. Uh, traditionally, re uh, leases could have been 20 to 30 years. They've now downwards gone to five to 10 years. And what's happening globally is a shift in very short-term retail pop-ups. And pop-ups used to be a fad, but now actually they're part of large digital native global strategies. And it's about having the right location um, with the right audience at the right time. Um, and, and some of the largest um, retailers, smart retailers, are, are building these into their strategies. So we need data to enable that. So there's quite a lot on this slide. What we do in property is we combine multiple data sources to enable brands to predict where audiences are located in the physical world. Our application is for short term and for long term. Um, and our type of customers are marketing agencies, marketers or brands looking for physical spaces for their campaigns. The data that we get, I mentioned it earlier, is telco data combined with app data and also social media. And the data points we share back with our customers are footfall, dwell time, age, gender, affluence, and the team are working on interests, and all the type of data that you would want to make the right decision, to put the right marketing or retail message to the right customer at the right time. We can rank spaces. So in the UK, we have about 8,000 spaces that we scrape from third-party websites, and we can recommend back to retailers which one they should actually carry out their campaign in. Um, Brands, target, brand targeting for landlords, retail strategies, experiential marketing, there's lots of applications to what we do. Um, this is just giving you an idea of the dashboard um, and how we present it to customers. So again, boy, me coming from a digital background, let's not reinvent it, let's look at what Google Analytics do and let's just copy them. <laughs> it's trying to make it as simple as possible um, as a dashboard. Um, so we're, we're, we're unique in what we're doing. We're, we are getting a lot of global attention. It has taken longer to build out than we thought it was, to be honest. We have done a seed round, which was great. We have proprietary algorithms, um, which are unique to property. Uh, we have exclusivities on data uh, with Telefonica, which is amazing, and an investor of ours. Um, and we have first mover advantage, hence actually quite a lot of global type of interest in property as an interesting application. Um, and attraction has been really good. So the type of customers we work with are brands uh, like your Heinz, your Schweppes, your Deliveroo. We've done a couple of pilots with Amazon through marketing agencies. Um, we're, we have done stuff with Tesco, Boots, um, and also we do bits and pieces with the landlords, but really when we're validating with customers, we're trying to go what do the brands want and what are they used to? They're used to those online metrics. Um, sorry, skipped ahead. So my background, my last role was head of marketing strategy in Paddy Power. I was with Paddy Power for four and a half years based out of Dublin. Um, and my co-founder James has had a few startups of his own that he's exited, not in this space, but more, I always get it wrong, but critical mass kind of stuff. Um, you know. I should know that at this stage, you think. And, and then our CTO, actually, um, when I was in Paddy Power, we acquired a gambling company out of Bulgaria, hence building up the ecosystem from there. Um, and he has a maths background, and he's helping to build out um, the algorithms. There's six of us in total. Um, and we have advisors based out of the UK. But the ask today is, New York is on a roadmap at the back end of next year. Um, and we don't have an official board. We are still at seed stage, but we would be really interested in 
finding a strategic angel or two who gets this. It might be somebody with a retail background, property background, digital background, um, and wants to get a little bit hands-on as an advisor and potentially put in a little bit of money as well. So with this, um, with this audience, there might be someone out there that could be interested. So thank you. Everyone, we live in the world of machines, autonomous tractors, trains, self-driving cars, ships, drones. All of them use GPS satellites for navigation, but for autonomous machines, this navigation must be super accurate, down to one centimeter. It's mission critical for big industries to define the location of their assets just with this much precision. So, size matters, right? <laughs> so, all of these machines, in order to be positioned accurately, have to be connected to a special correction station. This station is the boot on the ground and works within a range of 100 kilometers. And there are thousands of these stations around the United States, Europe, Asia, and they're all owned by governmental or commercial data providers, and they're all different. And I, as a drone owner, don't know how to find this station, how to connect to it, is it working or not, what equipment is there, what software is there, how can I connect to the station and get this correction data? And these questions pop up again and again each time I would like to start a new project. And we're going through all of these questions that lose time and resources. We saw the problem and created Hive. A solution for super accurate GPS navigation in real time. So Hive unifies the market, brings all of these data providers and all of their correction stations under one roof. And their data is available in one place, marketplace. Our business model is simple. When we sell the data from the station, we take 50% commission. The market right now is almost 5 million euros and it's going to grow twice by 2025. And we can go for it. Because we built business around this technology before. Back in Russia, my team contracted more than 100 data providers whose 600 stations cover one third of the world's biggest country. But now is the time to go global. And we can do that. So if we established a company in Estonia, it got supported by a European space agency there. We have a great team of mathematicians building positioning algorithms, computer scientists, information security professionals, engineers, who doesn't want to do anything else but build hype. And I want you to join me along the journey because right now, I don't know much about New York, but what I know is that the stations in East are owned by local DOTs. If you have someone there, we also touch base with investors, especially those who are into mobility, space technologies, or deep tech. We performed a, a couple of pilots in Europe. One of them is the last mile delivery robot company, Starship. The other one we're building with Motor AI. This is a cell driving, cell driving tech company from Berlin. But we're looking for other companies that are building smart machines of the future now. Robots, drones, admin systems. This is how the future is going to be. I made it. And if you want to build it with us, please come talk to me after the show. Thank you. I'm Simon from Hype. Let's call all of our entrepreneurs back up to the stage. First of all, let's give them all a round of applause. I think the two storytelling, um, energy efficient, fleet management, retail, and nursing home. I mean, I mean, we have a vast array here, and I think it just shows the depth of, um, just probably the tip of the iceberg of depth of talent in Europe, and I, we're very proud of Digital Irish to be presenting 
the, these incredible people and entrepreneurs on our stage tonight. So just another round of applause, please. There's, there's, there's a woman in, in the back, and then we'll get to you. I can make a short story. Do I like to use a microphone? We like technology. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, you probably all have a development uh, map, development plan, but what is the next step that you're going to do? Like in terms of clients, uh, you know, product development. That's a great question for me because it gives me a chance to, uh, to finish the second part of my ads, which I've out to. So uh, <laughs> in the next six months, we're really looking at targeting destination management companies, so floors and bodies, airlines, on the back of the line of deal, we're also looking to have all that nice data to try and get OTAs on board as well, and obviously move into content creation. So we're really keen on, um, on on that, and we're looking towards moving into New York City in the new year. So I think one thing we learned this week in particular, came through from every single mentor we met, that if you don't have a physical presence on the ground in the States, you're just not at the races in, in terms of the US market. So we're really keen to, to have some, some, some front feet on the ground here. Um, so so yeah, that's it's, it's an exciting time for the next six months. Next question. Next question. Uh, yes, so for, I think it's retail, um, regarding, is it just like consumer retail, the luxury brands, is it more like, what are you, what are you connecting with? Lucinda. Yeah, so, so, so with any brand, it's, it's another channel for a brand to sell their stuff or to get a message out there. So the type of brands, our first application was actually for spiritual marketing agencies. That's why when you see logos of like Diageo or they're looking to create, um, you know, Let's stick Baileys, they're not going to sell a bottle of Baileys, they're actually creating a yoga experience or a cocktail bar, so that actually you're tweeting about it on your Instagram. Um, but the brands that are looking at the future of retail could be, you know, let's say you're saying luxury brands like a Prada, could be looking at new options for concept type stores where you can actually build your own bag rather than just buy a standard one. And again, that's creating an experience. So for us, we're the backbone of the data for all those type of type of businesses. Do we have one more question, or do we go to drinks? I think it's drink time. Once again, thank you very much. Well done. Everyone.